Hi, chemistry. Welcome to bonding. Unit three is all about all of these atoms and ions we've been looking at coming together and forming compounds. It's our next step towards looking at reactions. So it's kind of exciting. Um, I want to introduce you today to bonding as a general idea and give you a little bit of foundation to understand these things that we're about to engage in. So first of all, as you probably already know, there are basically three different types of bonds, and these are the three different types of bonds we're going to look at and really dig deeply into um, during this unit. Now would be a good time to pause the video, see if you can name those three types of bonds. So, of course, the, our three types of bonds are covalent. Oops, it is covalent, but that was the wrong spot for covalent. I'm going to put covalent over here, covalent, ionic, and then metallic. Okay, so three types of bonds. We have an ionic bond, a covalent bond, and a metallic bond. And so when we talk about a bond, really what we're talking about is that force of attraction we've been looking at um through this last unit as we look at peri uh properties within properties and patterns within the periodic table so that force of attraction remember is proportional to the amount of protons as protons goes up that force of attraction goes up and distance it's inversely proportional to distance so as distance goes up that force of attraction goes down so this bond, really what we're talking about is a force of attraction between two atoms or two ions. And so it's really um, a measurement of like energy. There's nothing physical there. When we draw a bond, you can see in all these examples that I have on the page, we actually draw a little thing that's there. Usually it's like a stick or some type of line that connects the two atoms, right? But really there's nothing there physically between them. What's there between them is energy. And there's so much energy there that these um, bonds can get, these atoms or ions can get locked into position at very precise distances and very precise angles. And that's what we call a bond. So there's three types of bonds, ionic, covalent, metallic, and depending on the type of bond that is occurring between the two atoms or ions, it leads to compounds with very similar properties. So each type of bond leads to very specific properties. Um, now, before we go into all of that, I just want to take a minute and look at what's on this screen. You can see that I have three images on these screen, this screen, and it really is um, divided into an image for ionic, representing ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. Now you can look at these um, and, and consider what their similarities are and differences are, and that will lead you to a basic understanding of the three types of bonds. But what I want to draw your attention to before we move on is their similarities. So what you have on the screen here is the type of structure that's formed when these compounds or molecules um, form a solid. When an ionic when, uh, when a compound that's formed because of ionic bonds forms a solid, um, <clears throat> you get a solid that has a very definitive structure. Sometimes we call it a crystal structure, <clears throat> um, but the term that's more familiar to us as chemists is lattice. Notice that the, the ions involved with the compound that's being formed from ionic bonds has formed a, a lattice structure. So this is what we call a lattice. It's a whole bunch of ions for an ionic compound 
um, connected in a three-dimensional shape. And they're connected at very specific distances in very specific angles to one another. Now, I've shown you one lattice here for an ionic compound. This is by no means the only lattice that is formed. Not all lattices look exactly like this. There's actually a whole class you can take in college that you can get into types of solids and you can look at the different types of lattices that are formed by these compounds. Um, but you can see here a pretty good example of an ionic compound, a compound with ionic bonds that has formed a lattice. Now, covalent compounds don't always exist as solids or at least at room temperature. Um, they don't always exist as solids, but when they do, they also form a type of lattice. And you can see there's a bunch of different examples here. So we have carbon forming um, a lattice. This one carbon has formed a diamond lattice. And in this one carbon has formed a graphite lattice. And you can see same element, different structure leads to a very different compound with very different examples and properties, right? Um, in the middle, you can see a lattice of silicone, silicon dioxide and also silicon carbide. Um, again, there are some different similarities and differences there between lattices that are formed. Um, and we'll talk more about covalent compounds and the types of lattices they form. But again, similarly to the ionic lattice, the atoms are at very specific distances and very specific angles to each other. And then over here on the side, we have a metallic structure here. And you can see there's some differences in here as well. We have charges, lots of charges. The charges here are structured very differently than the charges in an ionic um, situation, a, a compound that forms ionic bonds. But again, you can see that there is a three-dimensional shape that is formed at very specific distances um, and very specific angles to one another. So each of these types of bonds, when they form solids, they all form types of lattices, but they form different types of lattices. And these different types of lattices are gonna lead to very different properties. Now, um, these examples we've been talking about are when our compounds and molecules form solids, but as you are well aware, solids are not the only phase that can exist. So compounds and molecules can exist as solids, they can exist as liquids, and they can exist as gases. They can exist as compounds in the solid state with an ionic bond or a covalent bond or a metallic bond. They can exist as liquids. Compounds and molecules can exist as liquids. Um, and the bonding changes can change slightly, but usually if we have a molecule that's a solid, a molecule that's a liquid, a molecule that's a gas, you're gonna find the same type of bonding in between those. The differences between solids, liquids, and gas are usually not differences in bonding. Usually they are differences in the forces that exist between the molecules. Um, and we call those forces intermolecular forces. Okay, so we're not gonna talk a whole lot about intermolecular forces because we are just getting into bonding. We're gonna dedicate our time to talk about bonding. So for all our intents and purposes, when something goes from being a solid to a liquid to a gas, it's not the bonding that is changed. It's a force between the molecules, not a force inside the molecules themselves. Um, it's a it's a tricky definition to make, a tricky distinction to make between those two things, but it's an important distinction. When a phase change occurs, it's not a bond that's broken. Um, it's a different type of force. Okay, so with that being said, oh, 
also, I did want to show you um, the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. Um, you can see there's a difference in structure, spacing, and movement. So there's definitely a change in order. Solids tend to be very ordered. Liquids are less ordered. Gases are the least ordered. You can also see there's a difference in movement. Gases are, have the most movement of the molecules. Solids have the least. You can also see there's a difference in space. Solids usually have the least amount of space. And then gases, as the motion increases, the space in between molecules also increases. And again, as these compounds or molecules space out from each other, it's not a bond that's broken. It's a different type of force that's overcome. All right, so let's talk about each one of these types of bonds in a little bit more detail. First of all, ionic bonds. So when you're talking about an ionic bond, an ionic bond is always between ions. It's between a positive ion and a negative ion. The bond occurs between ions. And so we've talked a little bit about ions. We've talked about how um, cations are formed by metals and anions are formed by nonmetals. And so really here's what, where we get down to our definition of when an ionic bond occurs. An ionic bond is gonna occur anytime there is a force of attraction between a metal and a nonmetal. And this is actually how you recognize an ionic bond. If I give you a compound like MgCl2, you should be able to look at that compound and see there's a metal in there and a nonmetal. And so this compound would be held together by an ionic bond. Again, the magnesium and the chloride ions are going to be in a lattice. Um, and so that it's not going to be just one atom of magnesium and two atoms of chloride floating around. That doesn't happen for ionic compounds. Ionic compounds either exist as a lattice, that, that would be the solid state, or if those ions get loosened up and we move into the liquid state, what you have are ions that are floating around and kind of sliding past one another. Um, ionic compounds usually don't become gaseous very well. Usually you find ionic bonds as solids and then if you heat them up to high enough temperatures you can get them to become liquids. Um, but they're the most stable as solids and usually at room temperature, we find ionic compounds as solids. Um, ionic compounds are defined by the electron behavior that we see. When we have two ions come in close contact together, we can take a look at the electron behavior and the electron behavior can also define the type of bond we're talking about. For example, sodium and chloride. So sodium is a metal. Chlorine is a non-metal. Sodium is going to tend to give up its electron. Chlorine is going to tend to take electron. So this electron is taken from sodium. We now have sodium plus the sodium ion and that electron is given to chlorine. We now have a chloride ion, and those two things are attracted to each other. The sodium ion, which is positive, is attracted to the chloride ion, which is negative, and this transfer of electrons is what defines an ionic bond. Electrons are transferred from one thing completely to the other, causing 
complete charges to form, and that's what we call an ionic bond. Um, like I said, they're usually solids at room temperature, um, which means the temperature at which they melt or the temperature at which they boil is very, very high. So melting point and boiling point is very, very high. This attraction, this electrostatic attraction, electrostatic means it's an attraction between charges. This electrostatic attraction between the two charged particles is a very, very strong attraction. And so to actually separate these ions in the lattice from each other enough so that they can flow past each other takes a lot of energy. So they melt at extremely high temperatures. They have a very high melting point. Like we're talking volcano level temperature. So super high melting point. Um, they tend to be very hard compounds. They tend to be very brittle compounds. Um, and their structure is almost always crystalline. And you can see a couple examples down here. This is just salt. It's just sodium chloride. It's nothing super fancy. But a lot of um, ionic compounds actually look exactly like this. Some of them are colored. Some of them are not colored. If you find an ionic compound that has color in it, like Himalayan salt is a really great example, usually it's because there's some mineral mixed in with the lattice structure. So there's mineral stuck inside the, the lattice structure and that's what gives a, off a color. A lot of these are um, colorless compound. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And then again, you're, you're gonna see that crystalline structure over and over. Um, I do have a second kind of model down here. Notice this model down here at the bottom is a little bit different. Um, they represent the exact same thing. They're both actually representations of sodium chloride compound. Um, one is called a ball and stick model. That's the one at the top. Um, and the other one's just called a space filling model. So you might see models in both ways, depending on what the author is trying to convey to you. But uh, they both represent a lattice. They represent the same thing. All right, covalent bonds. So covalent bonds are, are really interesting because they happen um, because of a because of a sharing of electrons. So again, covalent bonds are going to be defined by their electron behavior. And this is a big difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are going to exchange electrons. One is going to take, the other is going to give. Covalent bonds are going to share electrons. And we can see this in something like uh, fluorine and hydrogen, for example. Hydrogen has one electron. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. And when these two things come together, they actually, this uh, electron of fluorines is shared with hydrogen and this electron of hydrogens is shared with fluorine. So they don't actually give or take electrons. They share them. And to represent that, we, instead of drawing the two as a pair on one of the atoms, we actually draw the two as a little stick like this. So that stick represents two electrons. You can draw them in if that makes you more comfortable. Let me draw it over here as well. Or you can just draw it as a stick and that stick represents those two electrons being shared between the two atoms instead of being given by one and taken from the other. Um, and this tends to happen with things that are very close in electronegativity. So if two things are very different in electronegativity, like a metal 
and a nonmetal, one has this huge attraction to pull the electron away. The other one doesn't really have an attraction for that electron, so it's happy to let it go. But when two things have very similar electronegativities, they have very similar attractions for those electrons, then neither one of them is able to pull it away from the other one, and they tend to end up sharing them. And so you're going to find covalent bonds formed um, between nonmetals. And that's how we recognize a lot of these compounds. Like silicon dioxide, dioxide is SiO2. Um, it's actually a metalloid and a nonmetal that um, forms this compound. If you look at some other compounds like CH4, H2O, NO2, CO2, all of these contain nonmetals with other nonmetals. They're going to have fairly similar electronegativities. They're going to tend to share their electrons, and that results in a covalent bond. And so that's one of the ways you can recognize a covalent bond. If you look at the, if you look at the formula and you realize that they're both nonmetals, then you're dealing with two atoms that are bonded with a covalent bond. And we call those molecules or molecular compounds. Um, this is going to give rise to a lot of different properties for covalent bonds. But covalent bonds are interesting because they can form a bunch of different types of solids that are very different from one another. For example, if they form a network that has atoms at each point in the lattice, they're going to have an extremely high melting point, just like ionic solids. However, if they form a lattice that has molecules at each point in the lattice, like water does, for example, then they're going to tend to have lower melting points, like water. Water melts at room temperature, right? Diamonds or silicon dioxide, which is quartz, by the way, um, those are not going to melt at room temperature. And so for molecules and molecular solids, their melting point and boiling point can vary dramatically. Their hardness can vary dramatically. Their structure can vary dramatically. Their phase at room temperature can vary dramatically based off this distinction. Do they have molecules at the point in the lattice or do they have atoms at each point in the lattice? Now I've given you a couple of examples here on the board. Um, of some molecular compounds that have covalent bonds. I already showed you quartz up here. This is silicon dioxide. Below it is actually diamond. These are different, um, different diamonds. They're uncut diamonds, which is why they're not as sparkly as the diamonds you see in jewelry. And here's the structure for diamond over here. This one is graphite. Um, graphite, again, is just another form of carbon. It's just, it's exactly the same as diamond. It just forms in a different structure because of different conditions that were present, like temperature, pressure, and time of cooling um, when it was formed. Um, over here, we have a molecular solid, which is, has covalent bonds in between the molecules. This is actually water, crystals of water. Um, and the other interesting thing about molecules that are covalently bonded compared to ionic compounds is uh, that when they are melted, when the solids are actually melted, um, what gets released and flows past each other is actually a discrete molecule. It's an individual molecule. So for example, when these, when water molecules um, change phase from liquid to solid, you still have water molecules flowing around each other 
but they're complete water molecules. So unlike something like sodium chloride, when sodium chloride breaks apart, it breaks apart into the individual ions. Well, molecular solids like water or carbon dioxide don't actually do this. They'll break apart into complete individual molecules. So it's another way that we distinguish an ionic bond versus a covalent bond. Um, okay, that's enough information for now about covalent bonds. Let's talk about metallic bonds. So um, metals also form a lattice-like structure, but they do it in a very unusual way. So when metals form a lattice-like structure, what happens, let me give you aluminum as an example. Um, so aluminum looks like this as an atom and it has three valence electrons. Now, when aluminum forms its metallic structure, its metallic solid, um, what metals do is they actually release their valence electrons. And those valence electrons um, are free to flow. And what's left is a is a cation. It's a positively charged ion. And so the lattice is actually made up of these positively charged ions, which you wouldn't think is very stable because positives are not attracted to other positives, but it's stabilized by this sea of electrons that gets released. So each of these cations releases all of its valence electrons, and those electrons are free to move and ebb and flow over the whole lattice. Not only does it stabilize the lattice, but it also results in some super interesting properties that ionic uh, compounds with ionic bonds or molecules with covalent bonds don't have. So... Uh, again, we see the bond is characterized by the electron behavior. You're going to represent or you're going to recognize metals because that's exactly what they are. They're just listed as the metal element. Um, at room temperature, they tend to be solids. There's only one that's a liquid at room temperature. I bet you can name it mercury. They tend to have very high melting points and boiling points because of their sea of electrons that provides this great stabilizing force. Um, and their interesting properties that happen are also because of this sea of electrons. Because the electrons can ebb and flow, if you hit this thing with a hammer, it's going to bend, not shatter, because the electrons can just move. Um, they can be pulled into wires. We call that duct ductility. They're very ductile. They can be smashed and pounded into a sheet. We call that malleability. Um, they can conduct charges and heat very well because these electrons can ebb and flow. So they're very conductive. Um, they tend to be shiny. They have our scientific word for shiny is luster. Some of them tend to be very hard. Some of them tend to be very soft. You can see at this at the bottom here that um, lithium is actually being cut with a butter knife or a pocket knife, I guess. So some of them are very soft um, and can be cut apart with a pretty dull knife. So metals, because of their electron behavior, get all of these really interesting properties as well. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about metals later as well. So for now, what we have this overview of all the types of bonds that we're going to go into in this unit, ionic, covalent, metallic. We're going to focus on ionic bonds first because we just finished talking about ions. Um, and so as we move forward, one of the first things I want to do is I want to recap ions and kind of build on what we know. So next time we come together, we will start there. We're going to start talking about ions and we're going to build a little bit on what we know. Okay, let me know what questions you have. I'll see you in class.